I would like to start off by getting your perspective on what do you think are the two or three most important advancements in the field of coronary interventions in the last 10 years? Yep. Uh, Kunal, uh, nice to be here and uh, seeing you after a long time and I'm very happy with your success and finally you got to the place which uh, you deserve to be. Uh, with that note, um, of course, it was a very good uh, interaction this morning and thanks for arranging it. Uh, it was a long overdue. So clearly coming back to the coronary intervention, uh, the, the field it continues to grow. So the, what has happened versus what is going to happen further. So I, I would say the few important things which really have made a difference in our the way we practice the coronary intervention now, besides that uh, the, for the vein grafts, uh, the distal protection device became standard, is opening of the total occlusion, the CTO. So I think understanding of the CTO recanalization has really helped us to expand our interventional reach to more patients. And I would say the Japanese were uh, the pioneer and their techniques uh, by bringing them to various centers uh, and then going on further now or independently we are teaching other people uh, has been one of the big uh, major advance. Now what is the in the CTO? Besides that what we used to go and do integrate that put a wire in, across and now the better wire tech, techniques with escalation and so is the retrograde. So retrograde basically was introduced by Japanese that is through the, cap, the collaterals and opening the CTO further is a real boon, although you don't need to do retrograde in every case. So every month uh, we do about uh, 40 to 45 CTOs and we again dedicate our days where we do a CTO knowing that uh, the cases take long time. So other patients uh, should not be on the schedule during the time period, otherwise they get very uh, angry and upset because they're waiting instead of two hours, sometimes six hours and so. So the, and the retrograde of the 45, 50 cases, about five will be done retrograde. So that is important, why? Because other those, those five, six cases would have been unsuccessful in the past. So what clearly that for the international cardiology, I would say is one aspect is the retrograde CTO recanalization. The second in our field has been is the understanding that how you take care of the bifurcations. So basically when we started having the data that in a complex uh, bifurcation lesion, you start putting two stents and we have initially more complications the way techniques were used because you're missing the ostium with the T techniques and so and then learn that yes, if you do correctly by the, with the mini crush or DK crush or culot that you may have a better outcome in these complex cases with the two stent versus one stent. So therefore, I think second understanding is that even two stents um, appropriately done in a complex cases may have better outcome than the single stent. The third, I would say, advance in last 10 years would be understanding of the left main. Knowing that the left main intervention in the past is surgical disease, and now recently with the Excel trial Excel. and so, really has expanded that field, which many of are using anyway, is that not a super complex left main with a high syntax score of 33 or above, but less than that, uh, correctly done with a one or two stent technique, that left main intervention are also been doing very successfully by interventionalist in this PCI arena. The, then I would say that knowing that many of these interventions are kind of a last stop for the interventionalist, what does that mean? That there is no surgical option because many of these patients have been declined by surgery. Correct. So therefore the assist devices in this bad pa patient with a low ejection fraction and now the impeller, common use of impeller really has helped us to uh, perform safely these complex interventions uh, with least complication, of course complication can occur, but uh, at least uh, least short term complication and with the plan that even with the patient with a low ejection fraction may improve at follow up with a good revascularization and will improve their overall long term outcome. So these are the few of them which have been, uh, I would say, the advances and maybe one more advance I can add is understanding how the BVS work or do not work. So my, that was yeah. my next question. And uh, if we look at it historically, the advent of the stent was the first revolution in interventional cardiology. Then came regulating stents in the early half of 2000, that decade was all about regulating stents and reducing restenosis. Uh, there's a lot of talk and there was a lot of expectation uh, about bioabsorbable scaffolds that the stent will disappear. 
but uh, uh, the recent data, recent presentations, uh, especially the concern for very late, late and very late events because of uh, disintegration of the scaffold. Do you think bioabsorb technology is ready for prime time, or this is a technology which is behind time? Uh, and how does one approach discussing this with a patient, or who is a suitable patient for this? Yeah, that's a very important point. So therefore, that is, uh, I would say, one of the advances that how we understood now the BVS. One we thing we understood, the current absorbed BVS made by Abbott is not the right one. But this goes back, this is nothing new. Uh, we know that when original stent, you know the wall stent which was placed mm -hmm. by, used to be Snyder right. back in 1986, Puel and Sigwart, the yeah. major paper in NEJM, there were about 35 patients which have the problem complication in 32 percent because of thrombosis, they were giving all low molecular weight, uh, I mean dextran heparin, and yeah. dextran yeah. and so, uh, and so those really, we are actually that stage now with the BVS. So the field of the bioabsorbable or biodegradable stent is, has a promise, but definitely not with the BVS. So therefore, and knowing that uh, the last TCT, there are six other presentations, including one from, um, from India, uh, with the Miras uh, from Mary Live showing excellent data at six months uh, with no recoil and no thrombosis. But then again, we understood six months is not enough. You had to worry about se second and third year when the this degradable, when they start degrading. Correct. So whether it's going to create problem at that time need to be seen. So coming back to the point, I think the BVS in a selected group of patient, the absorbed BVS is indicated at present at a high pressure uh, with the uh, technique of we, we call now as a PSP. So proper sizing, uh, the pre-dilatation uh, sizing and then post-dilatation. So uh, personally we had no issues uh, at our center. But key is that knowing that there has been a so much negative in the media, patients themselves are do not want BVS at present. When in July, August there was a lot of demand, so in last few months actually patients were very clear that please do not put BVS and particularly these were the young patients with the proximal Correct. lesion where you say that that will be helpful but there is a whole the media, the, the public and maybe the physicians reluctance. I know many of my cardiologists have especially instructed me uh, for those patients that please do not use BVS at present. It's a, it is a valid concern because uh, we are looking at lesser and lesser duration of DAPT in our stent patients and here is a technology which is supposed to be better or at least comparable to our existing stent platforms and with the present data you are committing them to almost three, four years of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. So yeah, that's actually a very important point also. So yeah. BVS is taking us away from our field of interventional cardiology we are decreasing the depth dependence and now it's going to prolong our depth dependence so that it's ideology point of view. The current BVS, in my opinion, has a very, very limited value. What does that mean? Maybe one or two percent of your cases uh, on very re real regions because the patient wants it. The, uh, it was a proximal ideal lesion, non-calcific, so BVS can be done. So the rest, more than that, I think we should wait for the data. Because there is a other important, because I can tell you one example. So when this news came uh, on uh, October 30th, I was in the TCT, the Tuesday, the one, my patient who is a dentist from New Jersey, uh, we put a two BVS in LED, he called me, uh, we did a, as a part of the absorb 3 trial, although we don't tell the patients what mm. BVS they got, but he knew about it, so he's a dentist. Uh, and this was 16 months later, he had no symptoms, nothing, so he called me that I heard about uh, this late issues with the BVS, should I come back and put a, put a DS inside it so that I don't have this late myocardial infarction? How do you answer that? I mean, it's a very tough question which he asked me and I said there's no right answer but I definitely would not recommend that to do that. But just to say that this field has really has taken, shaken up at present. So I'll move on from here and this has been a question that I think many people have asked you and I've always you know, I've learned from you, so I, I think I should ask this on behalf of everyone who is starting out or is practicing, but uh, is not that experienced. Uh, 
Uh, one of the things that you have always emphasized is consistency, trying to get consistent results in the most complex subsets. So what is your formula? How does one achieve consistently good results in complex interventions as an operator? And this is on behalf of all international doctors who are also watching it, who are very interested. But I think this is the moment to ask this question. No, no, that's a very good. Um, and uh, it goes back to the saying that uh, uh, you keep doing the same way and you expect a different results is not possible. So key is that you do the same way and you'll always get the dependable results. So coming back to the point that uh, how you have consistency. So what we have done over the years is made the protocols and knowing that uh, our system is very complex because a lot of healthcare providers are involved in that, uh, whether it's a nurse practitioner, nurses in the lab, the fellows and the junior senior attendings and so. So basically we have created the protocol for all. So let's say from technical point of view, you always try to do what you have come up with a strategy. Not saying that that strategy may not change. So, but based on the available data, based on the experience, you decided that this is the way I need to do that same, that let's say for the bifurcation lesion, where I don't need to put a stent in the side branch. So I'm going to dilate the main vessel first, then the side branch, and then put a stent in the main vessel. Rather than it's balloon of the side branch, then it's balloon of the main vessel and stent. So even it's such a minor thing, but key is that you decided that this is how you get the best result and over the years you change it. So consistency, come up with the change and continue to follow the same unless the situation requires otherwise. Now, I can say that many of the things we adopted from other people and uh, particularly that attachment of uh, uh, even with our, uh, with the manifold uh, and the, having a, the special three-way stop cock in the middle so you can give the, uh, nitroglycerin or rapamil rather than disconnecting the syringe and you give it from the back. So many, we learn from people, some the giving your anti-thrombotic therapy, uh, whether it's a bivalent heparin in the sheet, in the sheet, rather than waiting for the nurse to give it, which in one or two percent of cases may infiltrate. Mm -hmm. So these just puts together, so that you have a consistent plan, you may change as uh, required uh, based on the uh, available data and experience and then if you felt that that makes sense that you incorporate in your practice. So, but do exactly the same way. So clearly, and as you know, with nine or 10 fellows uh, every year, they keep changing, they keep coming up with some ideas. So I tell them, you know, until it makes sense that we are doing different, that this technique is going to change my outcome, we are not going to incorporate. So uh, that has been the focus of our teaching, that has been the focus of our consistent results. So is there a threshold that you have before you make something part of your practice? I mean, is, that, is there a mental threshold that you keep? Yeah. I'll change the wire, I'll change the guide, I'll, something. Yeah. That's a very important point, the reproducibility. Yeah. So therefore, let's say I read in the literature uh, that we do a kissing balloon dilatation for the bifurcation. So then there are data that you can do a sequential. So you don't have to do kissing because this kissing may cause deformation of the proximal over expansion and more uh, flow abnormality, maybe doing a, the serial, the sequential or serial balloon dilatation than kissing. So we tried that. So it turns out to be that when we did a serial dilatation, so we did the side branch, then the main branch, uh, serially, that almost 15, 20 percent of the time you have to go, still go back uh, to do again the side branch. So we found no use. So therefore, kissing balloon technique came back again. So key is, it's always good to try something new and of course you give it a fair try whether it's a new wire or new balloon and if you see that it consistently works then you change it. If you see that after, I mean I think there's no exact number for it but it's a gut feeling. So many times the I, every few months some uh, the device company will come with a new wire. You say you know what this is a greater than, better than BMW, this is b better than uh, run through run and through. so. So we try. So you try and if it changes, yes, sure. So just to give example, 10 years ago, BMW was our workhorse wire as you, when you were there at Sinai. We uh, changed uh, to run through. The run through at that time and run through within few cases yeah. looked remarkable. So now run through is our the major workhorse wire we almost use. That was it. my next question. What is the, is the, is it still run through NS and fielder? Yep. I have, I have shifted to fielder XT yep. 
as my second choice wire, especially for side, side branch or tortuous or you know subtotal lesions, fielder XT is the default wire. Is that is it the same at It's Simon? about the same. We yeah. still keep the fielder. XT just because of the, even it may go to side branch, it has a, it doesn't give you enough uh, strength for the balloons to Just for crossing. Through. But uh, for crossing, uh, fielder yeah. XT definitely is a very good wire, even better than fielder. So my last question, and it will probably, it's slightly personal, but I think at a professional level, uh, in your long career and such a successful career, uh, being physicians from the Indian subcontinent, how do you think the physician, the Indian or the Bangladeshi or the Pakistani physician, how has that role evolved in the cath lab, you know, in the United States overall? Yeah. So I would say two things. Uh, one, that uh, if you see the interventionist, I do, don't know exact number, but uh, the predominantly, the, or I would say many, many interventionists are Indian or South Asian origin, predominantly from India. Uh, and uh, they were very skillful, whether they are here or in working in India and so, and uh, great results. And then more important is, they really take care of the patient. So I would say, as an interventionist, one part is what we do in the lab. Second part is how do we attend the patient overall, pre-care and post-care. Post-care patient get into trouble, able to have access to it. So many of our physicians, particularly mine, my patients have my cell number. So people are afraid to hear give cell number. There is actually app now. Yes, so your you phone says that uh, it doesn't give you the, you, you may be right. calling anybody, but doesn't give you your caller's ID right. and the phone number. So to the opposite, to me, if your patient gets into some trouble, they, of course, they don't want to call you uh, unnecessary, but you need to have that confidence so that overall care uh, is very well delivered, I would say, by South, in, uh, South Indian interventionist, uh, South Asian uh, interventionist, and uh, clearly that has been the part of the success. At the same time, we also know that this field has been a little muddied by some of the interventionists of the similar continent from South uh, South Asia, uh, who has been inappropriate and so, but that's a small percent of cases. But by and large, I would say that uh, the field of intervention in uh, USA particularly has been really led and has moved forward uh, by, by the intervention list of our South Asian region, particularly of India. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma. Always an educator.